Okay, we are live uh, this morning. Uh, just for a moment, we just want to say a happy St. Patrick's Day. And uh, you'll notice uh, I've got a green hat, and I think uh, Senator Chittenden has a green hat. Others have green on. So, Senator Kitchell, you have green on this morning? I'm not going to have anything on. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell everyone this morning, I, I sent this to the governor uh, Governor this morning and he, he texted back right away and he said, just when I thought everything was, was at its worst. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it's Wednesday morning and we are going to get started and we have uh, uh, some issue uh, from uh, Agency of Transportation, Equity and Inclusion. Uh, Michelle Boomhauer will lead us off. And uh, with that, Michelle, I think we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Senator. For the record, I'm Michelle Boomhauer. I'm the Director of Policy Planning and Intermodal Development for the Vermont Agency of Transportation. And I'm here with many partners this morning um, from AOT and across state government. Uh, joining me are Susanna Davis, who is the Director of Racial Equity and the Chair of the Governor's Task Force on Racial Equity. Um, e racial equality, excuse me. We also have uh, Lori Valburn, our Chief of Civil Rights and Labor Compliance, Christine Hetzel, our Organizational Development Director, Colleen Montague, who is with our uh, VTrans Training Center and soon to be joining our Civil Rights Group, Mike Smith, our Operations Director from GMV, uh, Wayne Gamble, our Division Director for Finance and Administration, and Ann Gamble, our Highway Division Director and Chief Engineer. And we are going to be walking you through um, our efforts uh, of historic um, um, proportions, which <laughs> are significant that um, we have engaged with over the years um, on equity and inclusion. And then talking about um, some of the efforts that we will have going forward to expand our base and to broaden our um, footprint in terms of how we assure that uh, the agency of transportation is delivering services in an equitable and inclusive manner and also um, accommodating our workforce in, in such a manner as well. Um, but I'd like to start by turning it over to Susanna, who is just going to talk about the framework at the statewide level and how all agencies of state government are pulling in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go right ahead. All right. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Oh, no, buenos dias. Um, so at the state, we are taking a very overarching view of racial equity um, it's something that has to be accomplished and pursued across the enterprise because racial inequities exist in almost all of the work that we do in almost every sector that there is, whether it's housing, education, criminal justice, um, transit, et cetera. So racial equity uh, is something that's being built into policy, not just at AOT, not just in AOA where I sit, but across the enterprise. And that's really important because what it requires of us is a certain level of uniformity of policy, right? That a person who's a resident or a visitor to Vermont can go to any agency for any reason and receive roughly the same level, kind, and um, I don't know, quality of treatment and services um, and that their outcomes are not gonna be determined or influenced by race or ethnicity because that's what racial equity is, right? It's not saying, We've got to treat everybody exactly the same in all circumstances. Rather, it's saying whether people's outcomes are good or bad, race shouldn't be a factor in that. And that's a really important distinction. So for uh, the state, some of the things that we're doing are, or some of the things that we have done are to incorporate racial and social equity into our strategic planning. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by conducting EIAs, that's Equity Impact Assessments. It's a tool that we rolled out last year. We're using it now very actively during the legislative session. And what it does is it's, a, it's basically a questionnaire that accompanies any budget or policy proposal that comes out of the executive agencies. And the reason that we use EIAs, and they're used across the nation in many jurisdictions, very sound, well-tested, well-received, and extremely informative. And the reason we do them is because it ensures that we're asking ourselves the right questions before we roll out a policy that could have unintended consequences for different demographic groups. Now, 
we, we, we put it out under the guise of racial equity, but in reality, it actually serves a lot of historically marginalized populations. The LGBTQIA plus population, people living with disabilities, people experiencing poverty, people experiencing homelessness, et cetera. So it's a very well-rounded overarching tool that helps us to evaluate the equitable distribution of benefits and burdens of our policies. So that's something that we're doing at, at a broad level. Other things include expanding and improving our data collection. We're a little bit inconsistent when it comes to race data collection. Some folks are using the Census Bureau categories of race, which many of us people of color don't like, by the way. Um, and others are just using kind of a different list and it creates a little bit of inconsistency, which makes it hard for us to compare data across the enterprise if it's being collected differently. Um, so our data collection strategy is, is going to be improved. Um, and one of the ways that we can help that is by um, supporting some of the other proposals on the table, which includes staffing for the racial equity office, which would allow for more data and policy analysis. Um, some of the other things that we are working on include having equity liaisons in every uh, agency or department, which I think is going to be featured in today's presentation. Um, so just having a person who can be the point person or a point person in a given agency or department for equity is important. I think a lot of people assume that this work sits with and lives with one person or one agency. But again, if we know that there's disparities in every sector, we got to have eyes on it in every sector. And so that's another thing that we've rolled out and so far it's going well. Um, and then there are some things that are a little bit more specific to AOT or agencies like AOT, because AOT, unlike many of our other agencies, have a lot of federal requirements they've got to meet. And many of those federal requirements do hinge on equity provisions. And so you're going to see in today's presentation, and of course you members of the committee already know, um, AOT is one of the agencies at the state level that tends to be further ahead on equity work largely because of the need for compliance with these federal regulations. And so because of that, I think that AOT is well situated not only to serve as a model for some of our other agencies and departments around the state, um, but also has a good eye toward how state infrastructure, and, and I mean physical infrastructure, spatial infrastructure, and service infrastructure, all three of those, how those various levels of infrastructure um, can must be used not just to accomplish the technical goal of getting you know people in cars from A to B, but also um, the overarching and ongoing goal of ensuring that we're doing so in a way that doesn't create disparities in the benefits and burdens that we create. In transit, what that means generally is things like are we um, are we putting health deleterious infrastructure items in neighborhoods that tend to be prominently people of color. Are we putting health promoting items in neighborhoods that tend to be affluent or largely white? Are we building, are we, are we raising parks so that we can build super highways through communities where a lot of um, seniors or youth tend to live? Or are we looking at um, where people need to go in terms of getting to work and how people commute shape up, what that means for them? Um, for example, if you're a person of color, Statistically speaking, it's likely that you live in or near Chittenden County in Vermont, but that's not the case everywhere. You've got a lot of pockets of people of color who may live in areas that are underserved by the transit system. So how do we ensure that um, where you live, which is so often tied to your economic prospects, your job prospects, whether you were able to get a job or were passed over for it because you have a name that starts with an X, right? Whether where you live is impacting how you live or how far you have to go to earn your living. All of these things are interconnected um, and are all related to different levels of racial equity. So I'm gonna stop there, uh, but that's a little bit of an overview of what we're working on at the state level and some of the considerations that go into this work, especially as it relates to transit and transportation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right, at this time, I'm going to um, share my screen um, and we will head into the presentation. And I believe that uh, Lori will be kicking us off. Well, thanks so much, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, senators, for inviting us in today to discuss this. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and thank you as well to Susanna for um, the kind words, but also for the amazing leadership that she is showing um, and leading the charge. Um, this is such an exciting time. 
And this isn't just a moment, this is a movement. So um, I wanted to share a little bit about what we have been doing at the Agency of Transportation, in some cases for decades, um, in some cases, some of our newer initiatives. And we will head into the presentation. And I believe that uh, Lori will be kicking us off. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, senators, for inviting us in today to discuss this. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and thank you as well to Susanna for um, the kind words, but also for the amazing leadership that she is showing um, and leading the charge. Um, this is such an exciting time. And this isn't just a moment, this is a movement. So. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what we have been doing at the Agency of Transportation, in some cases for decades, um, in some cases, some of our newer initiatives, um, <laughs> as a background for um, what we are planning to do and already starting to implement in order to meet some of uh, the goals and expectations uh, that Susanna was talking about. Um, so as she indicated, um, our agency has a head start on this. We have had for decades now a great incentive to um, build our programs, um, hopefully through an equity lens and with the idea of ensuring non-discrimination because that is the expectation. So our Title VI program is one of the prime examples of this. And the Title VI program is intended to assure non-discrimination in all of the benefits and services that we are providing. Uh, to the public. Um, and this is something that has been baked into our culture for many years. Um, we have uh, the Title VI program takes its roots from the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and all the legislation and court decisions and executive orders that have come down since then. And it sort of serves as an umbrella for all of our other programming around uh, equity, inclusion, um, affirmative action, et cetera. Um, we have had and continue to have a pretty robust Title VI program. Um, every single year, Secretary Flynn uh, issues new um, policy statements in this regard that get disseminated um, to our organization, to all of our subrecipients, posted on our website. We provide assurances um, to all of our federal funding partners that we are in fact going to administer all of our programs in a way that um, guarantees um, equity and inclusion. That being said, um, we obviously wanna make sure that we're not just checking off boxes. And so over the years, we've tried to breathe some life into this program. And part of that means that we look at how we're, um, where the challenges are and where the barriers are. Uh, so for example, limited English proficiency uh, is something that we have certainly tried to tackle and provide uh, an array of translation services and um, work with um, various community-based organizations to make sure that um, everyone who's accessing our services, whether it's at a public participation meeting, at the counter at a DMV or anywhere else, is going to be able to um, participate and receive the same level of services um, as somebody who is native English speaking. Um, that's easier said than done in some cases, and it requires a fair amount of research and mapping and all of those things. Um, so we have a limited English a proficiency plan, um, a four-step analysis, and the like. Um, the other thing that we've tried to make sure of is that this isn't something that's seen as just uh, a program that the Civil Rights Office at the Agency of Transportation administers. And so as uh, Susanna was referring to, um, when she uh, described the equity liaisons that uh, are now being established across uh, the enterprise and state government, we also took that approach with our Title VI program and we have Title VI liaisons. Um, this past year, we reappointed or came up with new appointments for 29 different uh, people who are sprinkled throughout our organization um, in all of the different uh, departments and bureaus. Uh, and there are eyes in our ears. Um, they help us to collect data. 
uh, if there are any complaints um, that gets brought to our attention as well. So these are all sort of first steps um, and things that we feel are building a strong foundation for all the additional things that we wanna tackle. Next slide, please. Um, some of the programs that we already have in place, I had um, when I uh, had the pleasure of coming and joining you for a presentation back in January, I had described a few of the programs that we have been administering um, using some of our federal funds um, from Federal Highway. Um, and our employment diversity in highway construction is one of them. It's one that uh, we're particularly proud of because it really has made a difference in terms of um, making the highway construction industry accessible uh, to people who would otherwise not have had an opportunity to enter and advance their careers. So this slide does describe uh, some of the achievements that we made in uh, the last fiscal year. Um, it's a very robust program because we do a lot of partnering. We partner with a lot of community-based organizations, advocacy groups uh, to ensure that we're putting out the word that we have these opportunities. And um, the program itself has made a big difference um, as we take a snapshot each year of the uh, demographics in the highway construction industry. We're looking to see the makeup, uh, not only based upon uh, gender and race, but also uh, based upon whether or not people are advancing. And uh, we're pleased that people who entered the industry through this program um, maybe uh, five or 10 years ago are now moving up the ladder and in some cases are even project superintendents and, and uh, for people. Uh, so we do provide uh, an array of supportive services um, to make sure people get a good start in the industry. Um, and then we provide case management services as well for folks that are working on our projects. Next slide, please. Um, our disadvantaged business enterprise and small business programs, we also discussed um, back in January, but just a reminder, these are programs that every single state DOT is required to administer um, in order to remain eligible for receipt of federal funding. Um, but it is a program that also uh, provides a lot of uh, opportunities for businesses that are uh, majority owned and controlled by women and uh, by people of color to be able to um, make sure that they're getting a certain portion of uh, all of the federal funding that's coming into the state. Uh, the program itself has been around for decades. We continue to find ways to partner with other organizations uh, so that we can actually deliver a lot of business development services. Uh, to make sure that uh, the firms in the program are getting access to government contracting in general, and particularly to uh, participating on our projects. So last year, um, the women in business, minority business owners in the program accounted for almost 14% of all the federal fund, uh, funded projects that we awarded. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is... Um, an opportunity for us to talk about how we are already um, kind of uh, developing and delivering um, the message uh, to our workforce as well as to all of our contractors and subrecipients. I think I mentioned uh, when I was here in January that all state DOTs um, have been required to have a civil rights section um, by, by legislation uh, going all the way back to 1975. But I will say that um, in some states, um, it, they're not using uh, their, their civil rights units to full potential. They're completely and exclusively focused on um, the external workforce, the highway construction industry, and monitoring some subrecipients. At our agency, our leadership, and particularly our current leadership, has always recognized that we bring value added and that um, the message has to start from uh, within our organization. And so we've been really successful at um, getting a, a shift in uh, thinking and culture um, within our organization due to a lot of training and policies that we've been able to implement over the years. 
Um, and I have a, a wonderful team of folks um, that are expert at being able to find ways to encourage um, at all of our agency to be part of this effort. It really does take a village. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also have recognized that we have an opportunity to be uh, using uh, equity and inclusion as part of our brand and part of our marketing. And we make sure that this isn't something that we tuck away, uh, but we have a, a process, even in our hiring process, uh, we, where we attempt to um, bring on the next generation of our employees who are going to buy into our culture, which includes um, equity and inclusion concepts and, and a respectful workplace. Um, so civil rights has uh, been given an opportunity to assist all of our hiring managers with the interview and hiring process, as well as the outreach and recruitment process. Um, we also are given an opportunity to serve on a large number of uh, different councils and boards. I serve on some with Susanna and uh, with other uh, members of state government that are, um, that are working on the efforts that she's been describing. We've also been trying to make sure that we are planting seeds for the next generation. And that includes a very robust youth outreach program. Um, and we continue to find ways that we can encourage um, a diverse a group of students to be considering transportation and state government as their future careers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine Hetzel. And um, I'm also happy uh, to field any questions that folks have. Okay, any questions at this time? Thank you very much, appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. For the record, my name is Christine Hetzel and I'm the Director of Organizational Development. I oversee the learning, occupational health and safety and strategic workforce issues for our agency as well as the municipalities through the Vermont Local Roads Program. I'm gonna be very brief today in the interest of time, but uh, the VTrans Training Center really is responsible to create a, a learning culture across our organization and the municipalities. And I think that we can all agree when it comes to diversity and inclusion as individuals, as an organization, as a state and as a culture, we all have a lot to learn and it's a continuous learning cycle to learn more about the importance of this topic. So the VTTC has a mission to create a culture of workforce respect, civility and inclusion throughout that workforce life cycle. And it really does start with our leadership. Um, they are incredibly committed to role modeling, civility and respect and it really starts with the tone that they set and then flows through to the AOT managers and supervisors through training, through empowerment, through the setting of standards and expectations. Uh, we make it very clear from applicant to employee sunset, the priority that we place on civility and respect. And so when we look at the employee life cycle, that workforce life cycle, it starts with the way in which we recruit them as uh, Lori was sharing so importantly, having civil rights, really strategizing and driving the way that we advertise and recruit for employees, how we onboard them, the uh, devotion that we give to new employees, setting that expectation, giving those resources from the beginning, uh, the training and the support, the way that we're onboarding supervisors, setting those expectations. Are, are incredibly important to create the right environment and the right culture that signals uh, behavior and learning. So employees and supervisors all across our agency have expectations set in their performance evaluations that require civility and respect and diversity. And not only the ways in which you should not behave, but almost more importantly, the ways that you should behave and include people and embrace diversity and differences of all sorts and flavors and colors. That's where the power of a strong team comes from, is from that diverse mindset and approach. All the way to how we offboard people when people decide to uh, move from the agency, 
getting their feedback, their understanding of how things went, what we did well, what we still need to work on is incredibly important. Interestingly, we have a high percentage of employees that will leave state government and then return. So the way in which we sunset folks really has a direct correlation to their willingness to come back. Next slide, please. So all of our programming is very strategic. All of the learning opportunities are strategic and are very well aligned with civil rights. Uh, Lori's team and my team partner continually, and we even trade staff back and forth, uh, interestingly enough, because we're also committed to this mission. So whether it's the way in which we're training pre-supervisors to become supervisors and to ensure their understanding of inclusivity, or it's the way that we are growing emerging leaders, the way that we're training uh, supervisors how to hire and how to interview, whether it's strengths-based coaching or individual support that we're giving to employees, such as through job shadowing, rotation programs. Uh, all of this is meant to create a culture that, that uh, embraces diversity with respect, but leverages it to the benefit of the citizens and to create a higher performing work team. And one item I just wanted to call out exclusively is the way that we have piloted decentralized reallocation with HR. We've built job series so that there are career pathways built into the system that are less bureaucratic, that help people to move through different job series like a level one, level two, level three with preset standards that make it much less subjective, that make it less about the individual and more about that individual's performance. Uh, in addition to that, we have many other supporting processes in place, the way that we contract and the clarity we have with our trainers about inclusivity and respect, the way that we do competency mapping for, um, for interview committees. Sometimes people can get stuck in ruts in the way that they ask questions or in whom they think is the best fit. And these competency maps really expand their thinking and challenge just moving pieces around and really challenge folks to take a step back and really think about the needs of the work group and to broaden what type of employee could be successful in that role. And then finally, we have strategic workforce committees that we've chatted about in the past that flow from our strategic workforce plan that really give employees a voice throughout the, throughout the organization at every level to share their experiences with us what type of programming they feel would support their further performance and promotion and where we stay, may still have barriers. So we've been doing a lot. We're gonna to continue to do a lot to support this learning environment about civility and respect and inclusion. Um, and we're on the continual life cycle. You'll be hearing more about some of our future plans as we move forward today. Um, that's all I have. I know that was quick and brief, but I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Christine this morning. Great overview. Thank you very much. Okay, go right ahead. We'll move on. Good morning, everybody. Michael Smith, Director of Operations for the Department of Motor Vehicles. I too will try and be brief, but those of you that know me know that I struggle with that. <laughs> so, um, from from the DMV's perspective, we have uh, we have Google Translate on our website to help uh, translate pages into various different languages, so individuals can gain access. Um, we've also translated the form description so that you know not only do they they're able to see the form that they're after as well as understanding that this is the license application uh, non-driver registration form so on and so forth we did this in consultation with the u.s committee on refugees and immigrants um, for vermont um, we also have worked on our exam so we now have our standard license learner's permit exam available in 10 different languages I won't list all the languages they are on the screen and this does include audio for both um, those in, in the office taking the exam as well as those using our online um, testing module. Um, we began based on some legislation that happened, I believe, two years ago, the New Americans legislation, use of interpreters on road tests. We piloted that in the Burlington office um, and had intended to expand that statewide. However, we got slowed down with the whole COVID pandemic. 
Um, we'll hear more about that in one of the future slides. Um, we've partnered with USCRI, the uh, US Committee on Refugees, to translate the license, learner permit, non-driver, and Vermont residency forms into the various languages that we have the tests in. We complete an annual review to assure that we have the most common languages over the last 10 year period. Um, next slide, please. Um, from the branch offices, and I wish uh, Commissioner Manoli was here because she'd love saying this word, the Ubi Duo devices. Um, these, are in, these are devices which are, they're very simplistic and it has a screen on this side that, that our staff are able to use and a screen that the individual on the other side that is um, deaf or hard of hearing and it allows them to communicate back and forth via typing, almost like texting back and forth. It doesn't save any of the information, it's just a one, one shot back and forth. Um, we have signage throughout the offices that off advertises the availability of interpreter services um, to provide assistance for transactions and communication with our staff. From roadside perspective, <clears throat> um, so we've created some visitor cards um, in consultation with the Department of um, Visor Cards, sorry, <laughs> partner with the Department of disabilities, aging, and independent living, as well as state police. And this is a way for individuals who are hard of hearing to advise officers of that to promote better communication. Um, we use uh, a contracted interpreter services for interactions at roadside. And we also use that in the offices. Uh, we have a gender neutral option that is available on driver's licenses and ID cards. Um, We've modified our license forms to clarify the applicants for driver privilege cards are not required to answer the questions in regards to citizenship, um, as that really has no bearing on that type of document. And I do believe that that is the end of my slide. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions for Mike this morning? Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. You're, you're okay. welcome. Next. Good morning. My name is Wayne Gamble. I'm the Division Director for Finance and Administration. I will be able to gain this a little bit of speed here, I think. A um, few things that we're working on and I'm going to expand on is we have, we because of the uh, liaison uh, group that Susanna was talking about earlier, um, we've created a, a uh, equity impact leadership committee. And with that, we are going to expand that throughout our agency and then we're gonna be looking at policies, procedures, trainings, practices with an equity, inclusion and diversity lens. Um, one of the other things that, that uh, we've been doing is we've been working with our federal partners. Some of those partners include the our, uh, FHWA as well as AASHTO and NASHTO. AASHTO is the uh, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials and NASHTO is Northeast Association of State Transportation Officials. Last fall, um, NASHTO and AASHTO were actually working on a resolution addressing race, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And Vermont was given the opportunity to look and actually add to it. And Susanna uh, wrote a piece and it was passed by NASHTO. And then it went nationally and voted on by AASHTO and it was also passed. So I wanna thank Susanna for helping um, advance some of Vermont's also likes and wants as well as the national um, groups. We also, um, uh, we work with them to try to gather any and all information from across the, the country with other states and, and our peers. We also work with our tri-state groups, which uh, New Hampshire and, and Maine on best practices <laughs> and as many others. The other thing that we're doing is um, we, we, as I said, with the liaison piece, we are working, um, I'm sorry, Boy, I'm sorry, I just lost where I was. So we're, we're working and learning from other agencies and we're sharing many ideas with them. Um, as you heard earlier, we um, have done quite a bit um, over the last few years, but um, we need to continue to grow and do better. Uh, many of the other agencies have things that we don't do or just starting to get engaged with. So we're, we're learning from them and we're also giving and teaching some of the things that we're doing. And with that, I'm all done on my section. And Turn it over to Ian. Any questions? Okay, go right ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Ann Gamble. I'm the agency's chief engineer. Every year, our civil rights section does many equity and inclusion trainings, and we're going to continue to incorporate those topics and push them out to our staff and contracted partners. 
will work directly with the VTTC and civil rights staff to develop this training and implement it this year. <clears throat> we will review our AOT engaging the public guidance document and use it as a resource for the training. The VTTC hosts engaging your audience with finesse and this will be specifically targeted to show staff how to assess the community being presented to, to support inclusion. On the DMV side, we've expanded the use of interpreters for road tests. We have the necessary contracts in place for these services and our workforce safety guidance to allow for this activity moving forward in a safe and effective manner. Next slide. Our planning and engineering staff have developed a new project selection and prioritization process in conjunction with local governments and regional planning commissions. We are in the pilot phase and intend to incorporate an equity screening process in this pilot program. For projects that are farther along, our staff will use the tools they've learned to use targeted engagement strategies to enforce, inform, and enhance best practices. Through the VTTC and Vermont Local Roads Training Centers, we will provide the same training and resources to our municipal partners to further support diversity. Our project design staff will also work closely with civil rights in consideration of additional inclusionary language for future contracts. And I just wanted to bring to your attention too that both the DMV and VTRANS have both added language interpreters on our websites. So to you, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> We're very excited about this body of work. Um, we're gonna be expanding to include a technical advisory committee of staff and potentially external partners going forward. And um, we're going to be conducting um, an in-depth uh, review of our agency-wide programs and practices uh, to assure that um, the, the most current tools and, and applications for um, uh, equity awareness and uh, inclusionary activities are incorporated into um, the core of our mission. Um, the agency will... Um, basically implement um, a gap, the outcomes of this gap analysis uh, throughout 2021. And <clears throat> we will um, base, uh, hope to have uh, basically an, an agency equity work plan with a dashboard of um, activities to and tasks to um, complete um, this mission that we will outline for ourselves as we go forward. And I've been involved, uh, Wayne mentioned ASHTO and NASTO, uh, and I have been involved with um, their work over the past year in my role on the Transportation Policy Forum of ASHTO. And I can say that Vermont is um, pretty far ahead in terms of our efforts, and we're excited to continue to move forward and, and share best practices with other states. So. I know this has been a topic of concern for the legislature, um, obviously for the governor's office for quite some time now. And um, we are um, uh, very diligent in trying to find ways to assure that the agency is a leader in this, in this realm. And I'm happy to take any questions or questions for the rest of the staff. Michelle, when we started off, you said it would be a, a model for others and, and it certainly is a real I, good, good overview. Uh, do you know if other agencies follow the same model or uh, they're all trying to do the same? Yes, all other agencies are moving forward with this um, type of framework. Everyone's got a little different twist on it right now, but because of the uh, leadership group that Susanna oversees, um, these best practices are being shared across the enterprise. Um, I know that the Agency of Natural Resources has a very active leadership team uh, working on this and um, certainly all other agencies of state government are moving forward as well. Great. It's good. Uh, yeah, good, good presentation. Questions from any committee members this morning? Do I, uh, I do have a comment. Oh, go ahead. Um, last year, uh, we had a couple of um, conversations and I guess maybe this is more than transportation, but uh, one concern was related to um, 
Thank you. The nature of certain exams, and I, I remember um, Senator Ash was very concerned, particularly with the state police, um, the way in which wording and so forth made a difference. And we were very pleased to see, in fact, I, one of the uh, new additions to our state police force, I believe is a, was a Somali from Burlington area. And so part of uh, the concern was um, how different uh, words or um, requirements actually um, are, are problematic. And the other, which uh, Mike referenced, in fact, was something was brought up in transportation and that was having the ability to have a translator with you when you're taking your road test. And so my question becomes one of how, um, how, how uh, we sort of think, and I, I think probably Susanna Davis' office is really trying to help with that. Uh, it just makes me wonder how many other kinds of, um, of uh, situations, whether it's language use or um, uh, the uh, uh, assumptions made about recruitment in the first place before you even get the eligible applicants are influencing the workforce or access to services. And so it's a more general comment because in, uh, several of the things that are referenced, in fact, were generated um, as a result of a legislator sort of picking up and um, following. So um, that's fine, but um, but it also needs to be done internally. So I, I just want to raise that as uh, something I think we need to all think about as we do our work every day, um, have a, sort of an eye toward the extent to which we may, uh, without thinking about it, um, uh, have um, obstacles either to getting employment or to getting a, a particular service, not necessarily a license, but, you know, uh, could be any kind of service from any of the programs administered. So th that was just one observation I wanted to make is that this is a start, but I think it's, uh, and that's why I was glad when Susanna mentioned um, really one office isn't going to change state government and it's how to build that, um, that sensitivity, um, that eye for, does this make sense or are we creating an obstacle here? It's really got to be um, developed throughout all of state government. Um, and that takes managers, it takes staff. It, it really is a collective effort. But that's, that's my only comment that I would like to offer as it relates to some of the discussion that we've had here in transportation. Anybody want to comment? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if I make uh, just, just sure. respond right to the ahead. senator's comment. Yep. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the comment, Senator. I completely agree. And, and I think um, just to expand a little bit, that's one of the reasons that we're sort of tackling racial equity in state government in, I mean, you can, you can chop it up a million different ways, but the way that I have found most useful is to look at three main categories. The first is how we are as an employer, right? So making sure that we're creating um, healthy work environments that are sincerely inclusive, which doesn't just mean getting more brown people in the photo on the brochure, but really means meaningful inclusion, appropriate promotional path, et cetera, right? So that's how we are as an employer, how we are in terms of our system, and I'll get back to that in a moment, and then how we are as a provider of services. How are we interfacing with the public and what opportunities are people getting or being shut out of? Um, and for the middle piece about systems, that part is important because it really makes, it, it, forces, it forces us to focus on real transformative change, not just technical change. So I'll give you an example. You know, we might say, oh, hey, we're underrepresented in terms of our staff who are of color. So next year, let's just hire 19 brown people. And, you know, you could do that. But is that addressing the, the hiring scheme itself that may be exclusive, exclusionary? And so that's what we mean when we say systems, not just pursuing individual workarounds and technical changes, but really a, a transformative change that's gonna help us get at those root causes. So I completely agree with, with what you're saying and so much of it really does have to be a hand in hand effort, right? So for example, if we're talking about language access, one of the ways that you can build language access um, is to make sure that, you know, we have enough multilingual liaisons in the school, um, which is sort of a pipeline to people being able to stay in Vermont and have longevity here because they've been supported from early ages. Um, so it, it is very much a multi-sectoral approach. I appreciate you saying that. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any further questions, comments from anyone? Great overview this morning. It was really, uh, really uh, good, uh, good knowledge. We uh, understand exactly what's happening in the agency. That's, uh, I'm glad to hear it's going throughout state government. That, that's great, great news. Anything else anyone would like to add at this time? Well, I'd just like to thank the committee for the opportunity to spend time on this topic and um, and to uh, for us to have the opportunity to present our information. And as we go forward, um, we are always um, available for questions or input or uh, suggestions you may have. So thanks. Thank you. Sounds like it's working well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I think that takes care of this portion this morning. Uh, we were going to take a break until 10 a.m. and then our next uh, item is at 10 a.m.